all for one family on stage. Their first gig, The Cars. Yeah! It didn't go in that we could actually be meeting our producer or that this could be a major record year for us. If you feel the emotion in every song, you give across the emotion of the song. You have been a wonderful audience and we will remember this. We will be back. When you're put in a situation where you have to perform, where you have to deliver, no matter what, if something happens. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it because we love it. Hi, everyone. This is Dave Reitzis. I was the recording engineer and one of the mixers on the Coors Forgiven, Not Forgotten. And you're listening to Coors Cast. Hi, and welcome to episode five of Coors Cast. In this episode, we speak with David Reitzis, who has seven Grammy wins and one Emmy to his name. And we're given an exclusive insight into his musical journey and how he came to be working alongside David Foster in recording and mixing on the Corps' first album. The interview itself is full of information and details as to how certain tracks turned out the way they finally did. We also delve into which moments in the recording process were David's favourites and why. Join me as we again peek behind the curtain on the creation of this breakthrough album. Enjoy. Thanks for coming onto the show. Such an honour to have you here with us and to be on. Thank you for taking your time. It's really kind. You're very welcome. And uh, it's great to speak to you. And it's my pleasure to be here. You know, bringing back good memories. Uh, I love what I do. And to share um, some great memories that I had with all the cores and with all the people that worked on the record is it's bringing back good vibes to me right now. Good. The world definitely needs more of that, especially right now. So I'd love to know how you got to the point where you're working alongside David Foster and the cause of coming to the picture. I haven't had to say this in a while, but I, I can I can probably give you like the 30,000 foot view. Yeah, please. Uh, all right. Uh, rock and roll drummer, grew up in Massachusetts. Uh, I think I always wanted to be a famous drummer, like um, along the lines of Led Zeppelin. And mm. So everything that I did was drums and playing in bands and when I was in uh, recording with a band as a teenager the producer and the engineer were talking to each other and they said I, yeah, I, think, I think we need to put a little 10k on the snare and I kind of panicked because I didn't know what a 10k was I didn't know at the time that they were talking about a frequency so I thought I had to go out and buy a little 10k <laughs> and put it on the snare so I, I got nervous and I said you know what I got to learn more about engineering so my parents said why don't you move out to California and go to school out there? I said, all right. And once I moved out to LA, I was like, okay, this, I love this. This is great. I'm going to be a behind the scenes guy. Um, and I fell in love. I, I was at school being locked in overnight, learning everything, wow. getting you know, as much as I can. I just loved it. So after school, I went and got jobs at various studios, uh, um, Cherokee, Sound City, Rumbo, uh, a bunch of different studios. And um, they, when I, I say a bunch because every time I'd get an opportunity, the studio would say, yeah, go take that, take that, take that. So I got um, called one day to work over at Rumbo and it ended up being Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, uh, which that's a whole other story. Um, and it just turns out the producer was Mike Klink and he ended up working on a project with David Foster's sister out at that studio in Malibu. And David walked in and said to Mike, do you know any young hungry guys that want to come work for me? And Mike said, well, I happen to know this guy, Dave. So he set up a meeting. I went out to meet David. We talked for about 15 minutes and he said, all right, here's the key to my studio. I got to take off for the weekend. You got the job, take, uh, take care of this project I have. And you know, so he welcomed me and that was kind of the start of our, our beginning you know he he had just come off producing the Chicago records and he had quite a bit of success and mm -hmm. um we started doing projects like um at the time there were some film scores we were doing I, I remember doing a Neil Diamond record a couple of Japanese artists uh Celine Dion her first uh record and then um in 91 92 we had the uh opportunity to, to do the Natalie Cole, Nat King Cole record, which was um, kind of the, the beginning of the resurgence of David Foster again. And it just so happened I had been with him for several years, so it was perfect timing for me. And, um, you know, at that, at that time, 
right before the chorus. I think we we had done some Madonna stuff. You know, Celine, Barbra Streisand, um, Madonna, Gloria Estefan, um, tons of different people. And then we made that move into the studio that we ended up, or the house studio that we did with the chorus. And it was just the, the next natural progression of David with his new record company, 143. Mm -hmm. And the chorus coming around at the right time and and Linda not being at the house anymore. So the chorus stayed at the house. It was just like a perfect storm of really all of us coming together. Wow. So that's how I, you know, I ended up with David and we did um, a bunch of projects, including on through, you know, the 2000s, but around the late, mid to late 90s, a lot of the artists that we were working together with sometimes wanted to work with me, but maybe didn't want David as the producer or he was too busy. So David would say to me, why don't you, you know, if Barbara wants to work with you, go work with her. So um, we had a great, great relationship. And it sounds really smooth, really an easy um, level of trust, which is paramount, isn't it? on this kind of work. Yeah. And like uh, he taught me so much about not only about the way um, that a, a session should go and how, you should work with the, treat the artists and treat the music and that uh, the integrity of everything. He, I don't think I've met anyone that has as much integrity as far as um, having respect for the artist and the song and the process um, as much as David. He really kind of gave me the feeling that there was nothing to complain about um, what couldn't be done. There was only like what can you do with what you got and the time you got it and do the best you can. And then it, it was as simple as that, you know, being in that garage trying to make a record and you had the gardeners out with the lawn, the lawn blowers and mosquitoes coming in and no air conditioning. There was certainly plenty to complain about, but there was a point where David just kind of said, look, there's not, there's not any room to, to complain about what you wish things could be. You just make it as great. Yeah. You know what you got. Yeah. Yeah. And that carried on through that project and all the other things that we did too. What I'm trying to sum up through these is kind of like what the what it was like to to be in those sessions and to 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 see the music taking taking shape. So your name has obviously come up quite a lot, which is great. <laughs> yeah. It's it's kind of a um a funny thing to look back at it from a point of you know, you've you've seen the success of the band and the album, and you know, at, at the time, I think there was no doubt that there was something magical and special happening. Mm. But I think we all learned through many projects that we've done at the time that you never knew how successful something was going to be. Sometimes you'd have this most the most amazing song or production, and it would go nowhere. And then other times you'd kind of feel not so excited about something and all of a sudden it was a smash and you know a big hit so i think at the time you were just like wow this is this is an, an amazing experience to work with a great family of the nicest people that you could imagine mm -hmm. you know these um and they were living at the studio uh so they were so comfortable it wasn't like they had to drive into the studio every day and leave at night it was just the most fun you could imagine yeah i, I guess it's going from recording demos in a, in a little upstairs bedroom to suddenly then living in a, in, a, in a recording studio, being able to do what you're passionate about day in, day out with, with very little hassle, having that creative freedom, mind blowing really. The one thing though, that it wasn't, it was not really a professional studio in the sense of a professional studio. It was more like a converted garage, <laughs> you know, that I, I can't remember exactly the, the year or the date that um, when I when I met David in 1986, 87, he had a beautiful studio in Malibu that was a real professional studio. Mm. So like the first uh, chart maker. Yeah. Um, marble floors, control room, gear. It was unbelievable. And then because of divorce, he had to move quickly. And when I say quickly, it was like a couple of days wow. had to you know, get everything out. And we were in the middle of making, I think it was his solo record recordings. 
mm-hmm. and we went over to his uh, then next wife, Linda Thompson's house in Malibu. Yeah. And there was a garage that we walked in and he goes, okay, this is our studio. And in a day he put down industrial carpet and drywall mm. and that was the studio. That's incredible. It was, yeah, it was, um, I think by the time the cores came in, we had put the console in there and we had some gear, but there wasn't much uh, creature comforts mm. that you'd expect in the studio. I even think at, it may have still been at the, uh, for the course, like there was the, the garage part and then you walk in um, and there was like a, a high ceiling uh, room that was like the guest house. And that's where we did most of the recording. And I think we were still at that time, we had a rope connected to the door so that we could just pull it and that would be our talk back. And then we wow. let the, the door close and then it might've still been with the cores, but you know. <laughs> Yeah, few creature comforts, but still having everybody there and David there, still being able to create magic is quite yeah. a testament, really. Yeah. yeah. And Simon Franklin, he was incredible. Even that whole time period with his his skill as a musician and his knowledge of the C clavier and how he integrated with Jim. Jim had done his demos. I don't even remember on what uh, at the time, but he had a bunch of demos. The way he interfaced with Simon uh, so that Simon could start doing the MIDI and David doing the, um, you know, the piano parts and the, the guide stuff. It was, um, I have a lot of recollections of Jim sitting in front of his Macintosh, big, big monitor, you know, no, no flat screens at the time, mm-hmm. you know, right, right in there and then doing all his, his tweaking and then Simon sitting there working on his thing and me at the console and David at the keyboard. Um, wow. That was a lot of the beginning stuff mm-hmm. that I remember. Do you remember hearing any of those demos from Jim and them working on it to begin with or anything like that? I, I'm trying to think that I think Forgiven Not Forgotten might have been the first song that Jim had something. You know, I think he had a lot of the guitar parts kind of guided down, at least mm. the acoustic parts. Yeah. And that, I think that might have been the first song. I probably, I have a, a closet filled with cassettes and dats and CDs. You know, I probably have things that one of these days I'm going to go through it mm. and see. Um, I know I must have a lot of early demos. Um, some of the multi-tracks too. I think I have Toss the Feathers, the, the original recording of that. Oh, wow. Yeah. And you can really see the, the, the growth, like even before Simon Phillips came in which was, you know, I don't, you've probably seen the video that I put up with Simon Yeah, Phillips. which was like uh, seven or eight years ago now. Yeah, I remember when that first came up, I was like, mind blown. Yeah, that what a memorable day that was. Mm. You know? Because he came in, we did the drums on uh, the two songs. And, um, and then I have some video of us recording the little interstitial parts um, the Irish wow. parts. It's really nice. Is that shot really. on Handycam or? Like a Super 8. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. It's my, my same, the same camera that um, the Toss of Feathers was done on. So it's, it looks good, you know? Yeah, yeah. But that was cool. We did all of the um, Irish segues, uh, I think, in that one evening. No way. Just all live. You're credited on the album with mixing the instrumental tracks um what do you know of how how that came to be is was it a case of we've already done the other tracks on the album but we want more of a a irish feel to it so we're now going to lay down other things and hope to weave through i don't know if there was always any intention of having those uh traditional irish pieces on there um but i i actually i think that it was probably Jim's idea to say, you know what, this is what, you know, they would always, you know, just sit around and play anyone that would come over. David would say, all right, come on, you know, play something. So they were always just doing these 
of family traditional Irish songs. So I guess at one point Jim said, well, we need to record these to have them. Mm. And it and um, as far as mixing goes, you know, Bob Claremountain is, is like blew me away. He He's, you know, a giant in the industry. And just, you know, I, I, I don't know if this was before or after Madonna. I think it was before we did stuff with, with Claremont and Madonna, but um, to, to spend four or five months working on these songs and then hand it over to Claremont and then, and what he did to transform those tracks into the mixes, um, you know, it was eye-opening and, and very educational for me as an engineer. Mm -hmm. But the mixes for the, for the um, traditional bits, we recorded them and they sounded great. And Dave was like, all right, Bob's busy with that you mix these and they, they sounded good you know at that time in the recording process it's a lot different than today where you've got everything hard disk and non-linear recording so everything that was recorded was with serious intention and that the sound that you were going to put on the tape it was a digital tape but the sound that you were putting on the tape was the sound that you were going to live with mm -hmm. when you travel from studio to studio so there was no plug in to add after or no gear that you would have an excuse to say, oh, it's going to sound better later. Every sound that you recorded was with that mentality of it's got to be the greatest it can be. So, you know, you put up these multi tracks and you're going to hear great, great sounds. Wow. You know, we spent time getting sounds, so it was fun. Aaron Shaw obviously kind of bookends the whole album. At the start, it's very stripped back and you have the a higher pitched violin version by Sharon and then Jim, I'm assuming, on keys. Um, and then again, you've got the full Bill Whelan produced track at the end to finish the album. Was, the, was the, the fact that the first track on the album, which is a very shorter track that it then cuts into Forgiven Not Forgotten, was that a full length recording originally? Just like a different take? No, I don't think it was. It might've been, a, um, I don't think it was as full as the ending version. It might've been a little bit longer. Mm. Uh, but it always a, was a, like a standalone, uh, simple piece. To sort of introduce the, the audience to, to the Irish flavor of the album, I guess. Yeah, and I don't, like like you asked me just a few moments ago, I don't know if that was intentional from the very beginning to mm. have little pieces there, but uh, when the idea came up to intersperse the album with them, then the idea came up, well, let, let's start with um, something that will give an idea of what the band is about. What do you know of the non-instrumental sides of the album? I was involved in the whole record, like the recording of all this. I, I, I don't remember the exact process that we did of like, okay, today we're going to do the lead vocal and then we're going to do the, the backgrounds. But the only thing that it, it just seemed to come off a lot easier than it does now. I, maybe it's just the talent of, of that family singing together and playing together. They, they would do a few takes or do a chorus and of backgrounds and then say, okay, let's do the next part. And you do it and do the next part. And it was done. It wasn't like you had to labor over it mm. and fix things or, you know, uh, this is way before, you know, what people talk about Nelodyne and Autotune. So because that wasn't like a crutch that artists really used, um, the performances were much better. We would fix them here and there, but it almost wasn't necessary because just the level of, of perfection was was very high, but the level of performance was even higher. Mm, that really comes across. Yeah. Um, as far as like microphones and setup like that, I think I used like a 67 uh, tube mic, uh, a Neumann U67 for a lot of the recording for, I know for Andrea and the backgrounds, the times that they played together were when we were at record plant, but mostly at the, the house studio, it was one at a time. Mm. You know, I think there was a lot of experimentation going on musically with Jim and then the girls would come over at night and we'd work on, um, you know, let's do backgrounds now or let's try the, the drum or, yeah. It was just fun, you know, that's all I remember it. That's, that seems to be the overall impression everybody's giving me is, is they're having to reinforce how much of a 
great experience it was and just a fun very freeing experience to create the record yeah it didn't seem um like it was painful in any way um there there seemed to be a lot of experimentation for example like my friend tal hertzberg who's no longer with us he's um my bass player friend we were in a band together and he was just visiting me one day and we we're like hey tal you want to play bass on this song it's like okay so we takes his bass out of his car and he plays bass and okay david's like sounds good wow yeah such a loss such a loss what i've been doing with other people is playing back snippets of tracks so you've been doing a bit of homework before this which is really lovely of you to to listen back to the album so i i won't tell you now but i'll tell you uh i have a favorite moment actually i have a couple of favorite moments but i have a really really favorite moment that i'll tell you about after okay cool cool i can't wait can't wait love that how can you not like have goosebumps every time you hear that melody in it? just uh, the beautiful melody the purity of yeah. how the the violin and the piano are coming together and so naturally they've obviously done it so many times um it's oh incredible incredible what do you remember of that instrumental session or that those instrumental sessions were they recorded live together yeah that would be live that's from the record plant the same day as the uh, the drum session all live, all together, Jim at the piano. There was a moment where David sat down at the piano and he was going to play and Jim was going to play acoustic guitar um, and the girls were going to play their instruments. But David had to leave for the night, so he took off and then I stayed there with the band. And All live, nice, um, nice intimate vibe in the studio and they go out, they know the song so well, mm -hmm. so it was just, let's do a take, it sounded good. Okay, next song. Um, Incredible. Yeah, it just came so easy. So I'm going to go into Forgiven Not Forgotten. Oh yeah, right right off the bat. Um, um, I would be sitting at the, at the board and the sounds would come out and, you know, I would be working on the quality of the sounds, but then most of the time just sitting there and kind of giving my insights and everything. And I always had delays um, up at any particular time. And I remember um, I, most likely on that song, I don't think there would, were delays at the beginning on the piano. And, and I would start pushing up a fader with a, you know, a dotted eighth note delay. And, you know, because we were all in the same room together, it'd be like, oh, that's a good idea. And then that's how that kind of delay sound uh, developed on the piano. Wow. That, that I remember, yeah, that was cool. Yeah really iconic for this album as well everybody knows that everybody knows that the the sounds um again that you weren't thinking what am i gonna do with this sound later it was like what kind of sound can you do right now and spend time on it. and just the way that he and david worked together so well david kind of had an idea of what he wanted um it was always kind of like a like these woe moments of like you have just traditional or simple kind of things and then all of a sudden you get something that just grabs your attention you go whoa okay mm. and then carry on with the song and and the beauty of it see the album seems full of those those little peppered woe moments on every song it's yeah. it's incredible what david's done on that uh, it really is yeah michael thompson was saying that he was he was usually in for either three or six hour sessions yeah um does that ring a bell to you yeah we'd probably do um uh, one two or maybe three songs over that period of time like we would spend the the time needed you know we had like certain um things like you know we'd want a, a rock guitar here and a clean guitar here or maybe a baritone so we had you know we'd use michael on on tons of things so there was not a formula, but almost kind of you had a, a grab bag of different ideas and you knew what his capabilities were. So you'd be like, oh, why don't you, you know, when you pull up that kind of sound and and you put a little edge into it or you go with the harmonics there, why don't you try that? And he would come up with something cool. And 
Wow. And he's like, yep, that's it, that's it. And would you would it be very focused song by song? Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, I don't think that we would like get a sound and then go to another song. I, it was just work on one song at a time. And Jim was very um, a part of it too because I think he had a lot of, like a lot of the basic guitar parts were Jim's original ideas. Mm. And Michael Thompson would enhance those and then do his thing to it. So Jim was very involved as well. Where is your sample set from? Is there a specific sample lo disc or location or set of sounds that you used on this rec record specifically that you can recall? Um, any samples, like I, I would do a lot of the augmenting of the drum samples, just from things that I've collected over the years. And we were working on a 48 track digital half inch tape machine. Mm. And on that machine, there was this miracle built in function that was a stereo sampler that was inside the, the remote for the machine that synchronized to the tape position that we were on. Wow. So, and I became an expert and probably at one point, if not for the whole duration, like the fastest and you know, most advanced user of that sampler at the time, because prior to having a, a built-in sampler, you'd have to, if, when you wanted to like fly a thing from one, one chorus to another chorus, you'd have to come off tape into a sampler and then back onto the tape. Mm -hmm. So there would be like this synchronizing hell or nightmare that would yeah. go on. But having a built-in, you'd have like 44 seconds of mono or 22 seconds of stereo. So it also had a, a trigger input so that you could load in like a kick drum or a snare drum and then trigger it from whatever kick drum or a snare drum was on a track and then record your new sample to another track. Um, it could also reverse um, sounds. I, I forget what song it was, but one of the songs opens with the reverse uh, vocals. The, yeah, the backward masking in Leave Me Alone. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like just like have the vocals and then turn it around and it's like everyone goes oh that's a cool idea and so you end up with something like that Leave me alone, But with having the ability to add samples or fly things around, uh, that was a lot of my responsibility as well. And it, from libraries that were just just collections over over the years when, you know, I think it was probably the mid '80s where people started like producing sound libraries. And, yeah, yeah. And things that I've collected over the years too. Cool. There are some great great drum sounds that are not live drums, but you know, and run away. Uh, some of the, the the snare and the kick sounds are amazing. Yeah, I just wondered if they, if you knew of any other works that included the same samples. Oh, <laughs> uh, probably everything after. <laughs> I probably still have those samples. Um, I'm sure I have some of those samples that I I use to this day. But they're all like um, hybrids of yeah. something. You know, the this sound with a little bit of this sound and a little bit of that sound so mm, mm. the next track is runaway the, the song runaway has my favorite moment i think of the whole record where when you listen to the song it's got like a nice six eight feel to it right um and throughout the recording process just to like keep from boredom i used to just start counting it in four so i would just like sit there and one, two, three, four, and I'm, and I just liked the way that that feeling was happening throughout the song, although there was no intention of that feeling. It was all in the six, eight feel. So um, I remember one late night, it might've just been David and I sitting around and I said, do you mind if I had just experiment a little bit here? And I took a, a sample of the snare and right at the end of the song, about like 350, 350-ish, I, I made that change. I started adding the snare on the two and four. So that, that change where it goes from six, eight to four, four, was like just the most magical moment. And David like looked at me and was like, oh, this is, this is great. Yeah, 
I, I, I remember that moment like just so perfectly. I, I see myself in that chair with that sampler and then going knowing exactly what I had to take out and what I need to put in. And it was just a simple little swap around of the backbeat that just worked out good. And then once we did that, then we kind of added the, the other music to co coincide with that. But it could have very easily just ended without going without making that change but now all of a sudden you you change into this kind of like upbeat happy mood and it just comes out of nowhere and it's just i love that it definitely drives the end of the song it drives the emotional peak of it and the the little trillings and and stuff that andrea does are heightened because of that timing definitely is there a version that six eight all the way through probably probably you know at some point it changed that was um it it was not intended to make that change. It was mm. supposed to just end like that. And I'm sure there's versions prior to um, prior to that. I don't, I don't recall if we made rough mixes on a regular basis like you would nowadays. There, nobody was like leaving to go home and listen and see what we were gonna do. So there might have been. There were probably rough mixes along the way but not like you would have access to all different versions today. Yeah, I, I just, I love that, that moment just, you know, I've, I've tried to find the right song to do that again. And it just, it, it, it doesn't happen, you know? And it was just like, it was just for me being bored and like tapping along while we're working on that song and say, all right, I got to do something with this, with this idea that I have in my head and David welcomed it and it, mm. it is something that I'm very proud of. And Runaway being the first single, have you got any comment regarding that side of the process? And why was was it always from even in the studio? Or oh, this is definitely going to be the first thing? Or uh, it was either that or maybe the right time. I think uh, right time was whenever somebody would be introduced to the band, somebody would visit, or uh, there would be a party or something. The girls would always play uh, right time as like a kickoff thing. I have a, a video version of them doing that at a party at my house. Uh, that's, that's really nice, yeah, the whole song, just a, just an acoustic version of it, it's really nice. You know, you've given me like a good a good excuse to kind of think about how I wanna release those. I'm, I know that um, Jim and the girls would like freak out when they see some of this stuff, cause you know, <laughs> it'll bring back memories for them cause you know, I don't know how much video there is of them around that time. There's, there's a, there's a fair amount, but it's there's not the internal showcasey kind of stuff. Right, right, right. Um, I've got, I've got stuff prior to that in Ireland. Like they've just signed their record deal, and they're doing a few little promo bits with uh, John Hughes. Um, but they, they're singing the right time. They're singing "Love to Love You," but it's not the album versions. It's not in the right. crux of that six months of their lives where this this is where we're our creative peak for the first album there's not a great deal of that out there no it's cool like for for a chorus fan it um it's very cool stuff it's another part of history that that's adored by the fan community it's, yeah. it's this album specifically where it all kicked off that it's 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 those it's that very tight knit group of people that actually produced the record, made the record, that family that have anything that exists. Yeah, because they were unheard of. The next thing on the list is the Minstrel Boy. It's probably from the same record plant session. That's insane that these are all at the same session. Which of those songs seems to have an orchestra with them is that one of them or is it yeah that is one of them you've got kind of like a string arrangement in the background yeah now it's not credited on the record right there's not any Correct. um yeah, there's nothing i'm thinking that those were probably thrown in at the tail end of other artist sessions maybe <laughs> like I, I i i can't remember exactly when but it it was something that was done once in a while where we book some sessions for other songs, other artists, and then maybe at the end of the thing, oh, hold on, we had just one more quick arrangement, pass out some parts, and then the orchestra would just play, and then nobody would say anything. So that's my recollection of 
how some of the orchestras ended up on those Irish pieces without having credit. Wow. The Aaron Shaw, the, the final track, the full the fuller version, that was um, that's credited as orchestrated by uh, Bill Whelan. For the most part, like I think um, like the middle section and uh, the big river dance section, I think we sent out um, like the, the demo version of it and then he sent us things back. Yeah, the yeah. river dance was huge at that time and and David wanted to include something like that on the record. And I think I might have, I think I had just cut my my beard and my hair because I think that might be after my wedding, which I got, you know, I, I cleaned up. But I had, I had a beard before then because I have a, a picture that, of me working at that thirty three forty eight digital machine. You know, I I was sitting on it and Andrew was off to the side and she I don't know if you know that she's a great little artist, um, but she mm. drew a nice me nice profile no way a pencil sketch yeah and do you have access to that sketch still I, ha I have it somewhere in my house yeah amazing it was funny I was uh I was in London working with Madonna just the two of us on Evita mm -hmm. and I saw in the schedule one day that Andrea was coming in to do her part little surprise visit um, an unexpected for both of us mm. it was fun. that's cool yeah i never would have put that connection together so i'm glad you mentioned that yeah, yeah. that's really cool next track uh toss the feathers that goes without saying it's just just perfection right there that's um simon phillips i'm sure he had a wonderful time i don't know if that if, if all his sessions are that great but this just to see his drum set and you know i i had been a fan of his for a while but him coming in with that drum set and he had his own microphones almost all, you know, Bob Claremont was there. Mm -hmm. um, and just what he played and the stamina and the, the, the brains on that guy are just remarkable. It, may, it makes me quite happy that I decided not to be a drummer and be an engineer and <laughs> mix there after seeing someone like him play. My favorite part is that drum fill in in the song it, that was a moment where we all just were jaws on the floor blown away it comes over it comes across very evidently in the video yeah, yeah it's um, it, it, just absolutely everybody just like there's nothing to say we're all flawed absolutely flawed it was a it was a drum fill that you, you could never have imagined in a million years and it just came out and it was perfect and it, it, wow yeah Next track is Love to Love You. There was a, a, a moment, it might have been around the recording of this song that David thought it was a good idea to get Richard Carpenter on the phone and let everybody kind of talk to him because he wanted to get somebody that had that familial connection and just to kind of inspire um, or give good vibes to what the girls were doing or what everyone or what all of them were doing. Mm -hmm. So I remember there was a moment where Richard Carpenter was on speakerphone and everyone was just kind of admiring each other and uh, David was raving about this new group and wow. everyone excited to, to hear from him. That's so cool. That's a good moment to put in. Yeah, that's really lovely. Next track is Secret Life. I think this is the song that Tal Hertzberg played bass on, I think. Yeah, definitely Tal on, on bass and secret life. Mechanized and organized to the beats play to see The hand that's been busy weaving fantasy It's so hard to understand And often we are blind But if truth where an ocean Where did it fit in the pool of a human mind And that's that's again that's so quintessential Jim there with his acoustic guitar and he probably even played the there's probably some electric guitar of Jim in there mixed in with Michael Thompson as well. Beautiful track, but yeah, the bass on that really sticks out compared to the other tracks. Next on the album is the Karo Jig, which is another instrumental of which 
15 seconds is cut off the front to a fade. I think I have a version of this where Simon's playing Shaker. The reason why I might have, I think that's the song I have with Simon playing Shaker is I'm in the room with them recording them warming up. I don't know if it ended up, we ended up doing the take with and without. The album version is very short. Um, okay. The full length edit was on the Love to Love You single. So it did get released. You know, we do a, a song or two or three, take a little break, you know, we'd all kind of go walk out in the live room and say, okay, what do you want to do next? And they'd start kind of practicing and go, okay, sounds good. I'd run back in the control room wow. and say, okay, let's go roll it. Um, maybe there'd be a false start here and there, but for the most part, it was just, okay, next song, got it. Next song, got it. Wow. tracks next being leave me alone what can you tell me about the back masking or uh, obviously you've already you've already spoken about it a little bit just the again that sampler on the 3348 was something that i got really good at and i would read the manual and say okay this is what it says it can do but i wonder if it could do this and i i would just try things so again probably just in a moment of boredom where i'd be flying the vocals from one chorus to another chorus, two tracks at a time. And then I just would out of boredom hit play and reverse. And then sometimes it would just, everyone would kind of perk up and go, oh, that's a cool idea. How can we do that? How can we use that? And that sounds like exactly a moment that that would happen. If I go back and listen to a lot of the multi-tracks, you can hear at the end of a lot of songs, moments like that, where I would just play something and uh, in reverse or I'd grab just random things and have fun. There's a few other tracks where yeah definitely in fade outs and stuff you can hear even with bits of the end of Closer there's 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 little kind of vocals that sound a little different can't quite tell why so that would make sense. Yeah I used to do that with guitar solos sometimes too where I'd take like a bar and um, uh, flip a bar around and you wouldn't even notice unless it was pointed out to you. There's um, songs that I would do with Madonna on uh, on the Ray of Light record. There would be like a humming that she would do and it would be forward and then it would be backwards. But unless I said <laughs> that spot right there and then if I point it out, you go, oh, OK, all right, I can hear it. Beautiful so record, by the way. I love that record. Yeah, that, that was a great record. Mm. That was a lot of fun. That leaves us with Erin Shaw being the full version of Erin Shaw being the, the final track. Obviously, Bill Whelan did orchestration. Um, and then I've got session musicians in Ireland on it. David made the, the demo of it, so to speak, or, you know, the, the arrangement of it. And then there were, you know, phone call discussions of what Bill and David thought they could do. And again, we were 
kind of all digging river dance at the time. So David really wanted to include Bill and 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 the band did too. But they wanted Bill to be a part of it some way. Mm. So they discussed what they thought the arrangement could and should be, and then we um, sent over probably a, a copy of um, at least an instrumental and then a click track and a place for Bill to fill things in. What, what a beautiful piece. Mm, absolutely beautiful. And to finish the album on it as well is just, yeah. Yeah. I definitely want to highlight Jim's involvement as much as possible because he seems, especially in the fan community, kind of, like, oh yeah, he played some guitar and then he does some vocals. No, this guy single-handedly architected what his family would do for the rest of their lives from a back bedroom. Yeah, he was such an in integral part of this record. It can be overshadowed a little bit by David Foster. You know, he does have production credit, but really uh, Jim was very, very focused. He knew what he wanted. Even you can see in that Toss of Feathers video that Jim kind of, he's always got his head in like, how can this be the best? Is this the best? Have we gone through all the ideas that I've had? And, you know, like he's, he's just, it was so great to watch him work and be such a team player and kind of the leader of the family. They all kind of looked to him uh, to make sure everything was, was going well. Yeah, and from being in John Hughes's band prior to this and then being in the Fountainhead, another band prior to this, his his knowledge of the working experience of a band and producing tracks together was far superior to any of the girls. Uh, it's just simply how many years yeah. he'd been doing it and how much older he was. Um, but yeah, to then just just the amazement that he's then suddenly going from a back bedroom unheard of to then being a co-producer with David Foster on on a record yeah. is that's a story that's just not highlighted. And I, yeah. I, I hope this tale telling is gonna be is gonna be instrumental in people at least recognizing that a little bit more. Yeah. And he was a taskmaster too. He was I think the word that we used a lot was persnickety. <laughs> uh, it just kind of comes to mind that he was very persnickety and persistent and um, hard worker. Thank you so much for taking some time today. It's been great to chat and it's been really insightful to have uh, yet another person um, from in with the band in the studio to talk to, to have their reflections on the tracks. So thank you for your time um, and all the time you spent with me today. You're, you're quite welcome. Yeah, and thank you for uh, supporting such a great cause and a great musical historical moment. You know, it's a lot, a lot bigger than we had thought at the time, uh, but the process of making that record is something that will always stay in my heart although I m might not remember all the details uh, the feelings of making that record and the generosity and musicianship and just uh, what an incredible family and I'm glad that I have uh, uh, this historical moment with them and I hope to one day cross their paths soon so shine on all right it was really great, really great. Thank you so much. All right, well, it's nice to meet you. Thanks. A huge thank you again to David for his time and for agreeing to be a part of this project. It's amazing, as always, to have the insight of those that were in the studio at the time of the album's creation, and a special thanks is needed for his trust in sharing unheard behind-the-scenes content from the studio sessions themselves. The show notes for this episode also include a link to the sketch Andrea Drew of David mixing at the desk. And it's so lovely of David to share this personal memento with us. Also included in the show notes are a link to David's released clip from in the studio with the band, specifically working with Simon Phillips, laying down drum tracks for Toss the Feathers and the unreleased track, I Don't Know. I'd just like to take this moment to again thank those that have reached out with comments or feedback from the previous episodes in the season. If you haven't listened, I'd again urge you to go back as the interviews do go in chronological order and as facts and information are found out from previous collaborators, this information is then used in questions given to the other guests. 
I'd again ask you, if you're at all possible, to subscribe to the podcast on the platform you're listening. And also, if you could leave a review, that would be helpful in getting the content to other people for them to also enjoy. Thanks goes out again to those that have reviewed. It's been lovely to read your comments. And thank you again for taking the time. As always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, you've been listening to CauseCast. Cast.